Hello and welcome all. My name is Christopher Finley and I bring to you this new sermon series entitled Growing in Christ. Over this sermon series, we'll be learning about uh, abiding fellowship with God. Uh, we're going to start with a few uh, sermons and we will open up our Bibles. And my prayer through this sermon series is that we all learn more about the presence of God in our everyday life, every moment of God. Every moment with God and every moment is of God and, and for God. And let's trust in that. So before we start, I'm going to ask everyone to get your Bibles because we're going to be going through a few texts. And I pray that this could encourage us to read our Bibles more. And let's start with inviting the Holy Spirit to be amongst us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, I thank you so much for giving me this moment to open your word. Father, I need you to open my mind and my heart. I pray that this sermon could change my life and for those who hear it, it could change their lives too. I pray that we could draw nearer and closer to you with more wisdom of your love and your grace and our salvation through Jesus Christ. So bless us in this moment, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so first we're going to go to our Matthew 13. Let's turn our Bibles to Matthew 13. And we're going to start with the key text. Matthew 13. On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. And great multitudes were gathered together with him. So that he got into a boat and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and he sowed some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they had not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they, have, they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away, and some fell among, among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them, but others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. When I came back from Mexico, I realized that I had an opportunity to work on grounds, and Dong, one of my friends, would always say, Let, let's work hard all week so that we can pull weeds. And I would always wonder, why? Why did he want to pull weeds? And it's because we would work hard mowing the lawns, picking up leaves, doing all these things on Monday all the way to Wednesday. And then by Thursday and Friday, if we did all our work, we can just pull weeds. So as we would sit down, we would pull weeds. And sometimes people would think, oh, just pulling weeds is so easy. But there's an art, there's a science behind pulling weeds. You would have to dig deep into the ground and make sure you pull from the root. You don't want to just take from the top, the leaves or the weeds from the top and leave the root underneath the ground because then what will happen is it will just spring right back up. So I had to learn that you need to use your shovel, you need to dig deep, you need to pluck it out and then your garden could look beautiful. Why? Why was it important to pull the weeds? Because the weeds, they pull sunlight, they pull nutrients, they pull water from your fruits, from your actual plants. And what will happen is your garden doesn't nourish and grow as great as it can. So we would go around and we will pull the weeds. So what that does is just makes the garden more beautiful. It makes the garden more more functional. It makes the garden, the soil, the ground more better when the actual plants that you want to grow, like your tomatoes, your fruits, your cucumbers, whatever it is, your flowers, your roses, they can get all the nutrients they need. Brothers and sisters, as you watch here today, may I suggest that we all, all of our lives are very similar to gardens. All of our lives are similar to the, to the soil that we are nourishing. All of our lives um, have to do with this actual, this actual um, 
illustration. Whereas we have weeds in our life. We have poisonous plants that are sucking the water of life from our life, from our experience. They are sucking experiences that we should be having with God. Great experiences, experiences of grace, experiences of mercy, experiences of joy. And they are robbing us of a fullness of our relationship with God. And and if we just cut off at the surface, if we just do it surface level, if we don't get to the root of the problem, what will happen is we're not experiencing and we will never experience the fullness of the gospel, the fullness of the joy, the peace, the blessings that God has for us by abiding in Him, by walking with Him, and by experiencing His joy every day. And that's what we want to talk about here in the parable that Jesus was talking about. We want to speak about this main point. This is the main point. Hearing the word from an honest, humble heart will bear fruit from the start. Again, hearing the word from an honest, humble heart will bear fruit from the start. Our victory is in Jesus. So as we go through this sermon today, as we open up the word of God, let us pray that we can hear these words with an honest, humble heart willing to make a decision to walk in obedience to the word of God. So we may ask, where does the problem come in? So where do we fall off of track? Where does our soil start to spoil? And where do the thorns start to grow in? Where does the ruin enter into our gardens? The problem starts when we start to resist the Spirit of God. We become neglectful of God's Word and God's Word. Then we lose our dependence upon God. The Word of God fails to accomplish its work in our hearts and our lives, but the reason is to be found in ourselves. We are responsible for the hardness of heart we are gaining and what is preventing the good seed from taking root in our lives and our souls. But the result is not beyond our control. There is good news. There is a solution. Amen? Christ blessed his disciples because they saw and heard with eyes and ears that believed. We need to pray for our honest hearts that yield to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The garden of our hearts must be cultivated. We need to cultivate the garden of our hearts every day. The power of choice is ours. That's one thing that we do have. We have a power of choice. The soul must be broken in us by deep repentance of sin. Poisonous satanic plants must be uprooted. And now we need to ask ourselves, what are the characteristics? What are the habits? What are the the thoughts? What are the motives? that we need to hand over to God because they don't come from God. The Spirit of God is ever seeking to break that spell, that infatuation, that sin that holds us and absorbs us to these worldly things around us. And it wants to work in us the love, the appreciation for God's Word, God's mission, and our overall desire to serve God. So how does this apply to us every single day? The even evil tendencies of the natural heart can be overcome only by earnest effort in the name and strength of Jesus. Amen? Sow to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. We can find that in Hosea 10, 12. The work that Jesus desires for us, we must cooperate with him. So now we need to ask ourselves, what is this, what is the type of ground in our life? What is the stony ground in our life? What is the ground in our life, the aspects of our lives that the Holy Spirit wants to cultivate, but we have allowed to lie idle. We have allowed these roots to grow up into our lives. And now It's time to allow God to cultivate that good ground in our life. Hearing the word from an honest, humble heart, we will bear fruit from the start. Our joy is in Jesus Christ. Heart-to-heart work is needed. 
how do we cultivate the ground? How do we have good soil? That's a question that people may ask. All right, then how do I get this good soil? We need to start doing personal labor for the souls that are being lost. And first, we have to start with ourselves. Yes, we may say, you know, I've tried to reason with people around me. I've even tried to reason with myself. But it comes to a point where logic won't work. It's going to take Christ and his sacrifice on the cross to for us to comprehend that, for that love to break our stony hearts and give us a heart of flesh so that we could accept the gospel for ourselves. We could accept what Christ has done for us, the fact that we have a second chance. And that love shared with others will also allow their hearts to be broken so that they can live in accordance to God's word. And when the heart is softened, like when the soil is softened, that's when the seed can go in and grow. It's the same with the word of God. When our hearts are softened, when we understand what Christ has done for us, that's when the seed of the word of God can go into our hearts and that we could actually allow the word to take root. So now we need to ask these questions before we dive in. Do we appreciate and understand the blessedness of the working of Christ? Are we following him in self-denial and enduring the, the hardness as good soldiers? Are we, are we good soldiers of Christ? Are we learning to experience the joy of winning souls for him? When you realize how much Christ has done for you and you read your Bible, do you enjoy seeing people around you be transformed by his word also? In the love of interest of others around us, are we losing sight of self? When we finally say, you know what, I'm going to break the stony ground, I'm going to give my life to Christ. What will be the result of that? The pleasures of this world will lose the power to attract us. We're not going to be attracted to this world anymore because we have a heavenly hope. We're going to realize that this is not our final destination. This is not our home. This is We're just pilgrims. And the power of truth will begin to do its work in us. So those everyday problems and the things that may make us feel anxiety they're not going to make us feel anxious anymore because we're actually allowing this word to abide in us and to transform us and then we feel more peace so it will break that stony ground and it will just not cut off the thorns or the roots off the top but it will go dig deep into the roots and and christ will replenish our soil and replenish our ground so that we could have a garden that bears fruit So now, as we make an appeal, the appeal I want to make is for us to determine what type of ground we want to make in our lives. What type of ground do we want to have in our lives? Because the garden of the heart must be cultivated. We have to cultivate our hearts daily. Are you a wayside hearer? Are you a stony ground hearer? Are you a thorny ground hearer? You don't you don't need to stay that way. If you say, you know what, I'm a wayside here, stuff, the word of God just falls at the wayside, you don't need to say that way. I'm a stony ground here, you know, I hear the word in the moment, but, you know, I may grow a little, but then I just die when temptation comes or it gets too hot, then you don't need to stay that way. I'm a thorny ground here, you know, things choke the fruit around me or they choke my plant there's situations in life that cause me to disbelieve or to doubt you don't need to stay that way christ makes an appeal right here at the end of this first uh, part of chapter 13 that we read he says in verse 9 he who has ears to hear let him hear so that's an appeal to all of us and then after he goes over what he says in verse 9 he starts to break down the parable and why he teaches in parables. Because if you look in verse 10, it says, And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, 
Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I shall heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For as surely I say to you, that many prophets and righteous men desire to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. So now, if we look at the problem that is being stated here, the closed hearts to the word of God, all right? This is, if we look at the cultural problem, this was the Pharisees of Christ's day. They closed their, their eyes to all the miracles that Christ is doing, lest they should see. They closed their eyes to the teachings and did not allow it to transform their hearts, lest they should hear. Therefore, the truth could not reach their hearts. This was a self-imposed blindness. This was horrible. This was the, f the fact that these Pharisees, they were awaiting the coming Messiah. And the Messiah had come. And he visited them first in the temple. We know that from Luke 2, 41. We know that right after um, they had the, the, the exodus, the, the, they had the celebration right in Jerusalem. Every single year, they would go to Jerusalem to celebrate the different feasts, the Passover, all of these things. And they celebrated the Exodus. And they celebrated everything that pointed to the coming Messiah. Jesus went into the synagogue, into that small school. And he was sitting amongst the Pharisees, the doctors, the lawyers, the teachers. And he was reasoning with them. And he was opening up the prophecies to them. And he was sharing with them the prophecies that pointed to the coming Messiah and they could not see that this was the Messiah right amongst them because the blindness of their heart and because of the sin, their sin polluted hearts because they were so interested in the, the services and not the Savior. And, and this is where we need to be very careful. Is this word coming into our hearts? Is it changing our hearts? Is it transforming our lives? Are we growing in Christ every single day? Are we walking closer with God every single day? Are we experiencing the grace of God every single day? Or are we fearful in these times of trouble? Are we losing hope? Brothers and sisters, we have no need to lose hope. Jesus Christ is in control. He loves you. He cares for you. And He is willing to open up your hearts and your minds if you humbly seek a relationship with him through his word, through Bible study, through prayer. And, 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 and how do we know this? We know this because when the disciples asked, it shows us the beautifulness that Christ had where he shared with his disciples exactly why he shared parables. Exactly why he made it in parables so that they could understand and so that they could see the story from a different perspective and that the word could penetrate their hearts. The solution is that the disciples receive the word, not as the, the word of men, but it, as it is in the truth of the word of God. Let's turn to 1 Thessalonians 2.13. And we see this right here. It says, For the reason we also thank God without ceasing, because what you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. So, so that's where we have to look at the word of God. We have to look at the word of God as when the word of God is being opened. Whoever's preaching it, whoever's telling it to you, whether it's a Bible study, whether it's devotions in the morning, we are looking at the word of God as powerful, transforming, life-changing, the living water that is transforming our lives. And we're accepting it as that. The Word is a living reality. The, the disciples experienced that seeing the life of Christ. And then they saw the results at Pentecost. And, and, and the Holy Spirit is going to rain down on our lives again and again if we go into this Word knowing that this is a transforming word 
that has the power to change our lives forever. For us, the Word of God must be a living reality. It's not just a book that we read in the morning and the night. No, this is the powerful word that gives us life, that created the universe, that created the world, and is gonna transform our stony hearts, stony grounds into the image of Christ. And that's what Christ wants to do for all of us. Christ wanted to change the hearts of his disciples, change the hearts of the, the listeners, and he, he seeked and loved everyone who listened to him. But there were some who didn't want to hear what Christ had to say. We receive the blessing when we open our minds and our hearts to receive it. So now, when it comes to everything that we do, we really need to look deep into our lives. And we need to say, pureness and purpose. Pureness and purpose. That's what every single thing that we do is, is the foundation of the pureness of Christ and the purpose of God's mission. And that's more important than strength and intellect. Because you can know so much about the Bible. You can know so much about the Word of God. You can know every doctrine. But if you are not going out there with pureness and purpose to share the Word of God, you are doing everything in vain. You are doing everything in vain. Let's use an illustration. Let's say somebody gives you 10 acres of land, but the soil is horrible. It cannot create any fruit. It cannot do anything. But if somebody gave you one acre, but it was the most richest soil and you could plant fruits and they'll grow season by season, year by year, no matter what, uh, what the world is going through, what the climate is, this one acre is flourishing and it's bringing you fruit and crop. Which one would you rather? Would you rather have the quantity of the 10 acres where you can't grow anything, the soil is bad soil and it's horrible, or would you rather have that one acre of that cultivated uh, land, soil, that will bring you crops and fruit? And that's the way that God is looking at it. You may be humble, little talent that you think, but you are going to be a mighty tool, vessel in the, wor in, in the work of God by using the Word of God because you have pureness and purpose. And that's what it's all about, brothers and sisters. It's not about you need to know every single thing and you need to be the smartest out there. Yes, study your word, learn your scripture, know how to defend what you believe in in the hope in Jesus Christ and your salvation through Jesus Christ. Study to show thyself approved, a workman that needed not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And make sure that you do that in pureness and purpose for God's mission. There is power in simplicity and an earnest willingness to serve God in purity and purpose. There's, there's power in simplicity. There's power in a simple life that is there purely to serve God with a purpose for his mission. Remember that, brothers and sisters. If you look at the way that Christ explained why he speaks in parables, then what the parable means is to show that God gives wisdom to those seeking in a sincerity of heart. If you come to God in sincerity of heart, He is going to bless you. All you have to do is be sincere and have an open heart that God can use, that God is willing to mold, to say, Lord, help me. Lord, abide in me. Lord, work through me. And that's what the disciples were doing to Jesus at that time. Lord, show us, tell us, why do you teach in parables? Now we go to James 1.5. James 1.5. Let's turn to James 1.5. And as we turn to James 1.5, we will see James 1, 5. It says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. So if you ask God, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. So if any of us go to God, that's how beautiful Jesus is, that any of us who go to God, he is going to give us wisdom. He will give us the wisdom we need to take it step by step to make it through this life and to be able to see him face to face and for him to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. 
as we look into how Jesus explained the parable of the sower, we'll see these different examples. So I'm going to read these examples. We're going back to Matthew 13. We're going to go from verse 18, and then we're going to go to verse 23, and then we're going to break down every part piece by piece. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received the seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it. I'm a Okay, verse, let's go to verse 18. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away the word, what was sown in his heart. This is he who received the seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution rises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and carries this word and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. So here we see in the, the parable of Jesus that there's different places where the seed can fall. The first one is on the wayside, right? And what is the wayside? The, the wayside is when the word of God, it's, it's heard, but it's heard with in, in attentive ears. Like they're listening, but they're not listening attentively. Listening intentionally. That this is not happening. Okay? And, and, and it says it right here. Okay? It says it, it shows it right here. Okay? It says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches it away that which was sown in his heart. This is he who receives by the wayside. And now we have to ask ourselves, are we wayside hearers? Are we, are, are we, are we wayside hearers? All right? Are we absorbed in, absorbed in selfish aims and sinful indulgences? Is the soul becoming hardened? And that's represented in Hebrew 3.13. Keep your finger in Matthew 13. And let's go over to Hebrews 3.13. Hebrews 3.13. So Hebrews 3.13, it says, 
but exhort one another while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And that's what sin does. It hardens the soil in our ground, in our garden. It hardens the soil so that no fruit can grow. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. The wayside hearers, they don't understand that the word of God applies to them. They don't realize their need for it. Let's turn to 2 Timothy 3.16. 2 Timothy 3.16. So 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture, how much scripture? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So I'll put up this chart and it's showing you what the Bible is supposed to do for our lives. We see doctrine. Doctrine is supposed to show us the path to walk on. Instruction, it shows us how to stay on that righteous path. But then there's sometimes when we come off of the path. We come off of the path, we may fall, we may make mistakes, we may sin. And then that's where we have reproof. Reproof, it shows us where you've gotten off the path. And that is the grace of God. The grace of God to reprove us and to show us, no, my son, my daughter, get back on the path. And then we, we have a choice to make. It's either we could come off and go off on the tail end and just leave and leave God and not take the reproof. Or we could take the correction from the word of God. And it shows us how to get back on that narrow path. And then we could continue to see what is the path we should walk on and how do we stay on that path. Amen? So that is the purpose of Scripture. Now, some people, that grace, that message of God's grace does not apply to them. They're not interested in it. They don't want it. They don't want anything to do with it. But we need to realize this, brothers and sisters. There's a great controversy going on between good and evil. There's good angels and there's demons, where you have angels who are fighting for you to be close with God more and more every day, to experience the fullness of the gospel, who are ministering onto us, who are protecting us, who are walking with us, who are ministering to us while we are in our studies, working to show us God's grace in our life. And then you have the enemy doing all that he can to snatch away the word from your life. So we need to be careful about these distractions, these worldly schemes, these criticisms that we get when we try to walk with God, the doubt that we may hear in others or even in ourselves, and even the unbelief in God's word and God's transforming power. What's the result of the wayside hearers of all these things? The good seed finds no place to take root and the enemy catches it away. Next, in stony places, all right? In stony places, we see what happens to the stony hearer. And we start in verse 20. But he who receives the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. When tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. So we need to be very careful with this because we hear the word, we're like, yes, amen. We feel it. We feel it in that moment. But if that word and that promise and our faith is not rooted in the power of God, rooted in the Holy Spirit working in us, we're not going to see the results of the fruit. Because when the temptation and the problems come, they're gonna, it's just going to wither away that growth that we experienced. Okay, I want to read something from the book Christ Object Lessons. The hot summer sun, it strengthens and ripens the hardened grain destroys that which has no depth of root. So he who has not the word of God rooted in himself will stand for a while. But when tribulation comes because of the word, by, by and by he is offended. So that's what many of us are going through in our Christian experiences when we don't have the word of God rooted inside of us, right? How does this apply? Many receive the gospel as a way of escape from suffering rather than a deliverance, 
A deliverance, a deliverance from sin, a deliverance from the character that does not re uh, represent our Savior. We cannot just take the gospel because we know that the graces of God will protect us through hard times. We can't just accept it for that. We need to accept the Word of God as a transforming power in our lives, here to transform us back to the image that God had originally had for us in His image. That's what God wants to do to all of us every single day. Restore us to his image of love, his image of grace, his image of purity, his image of oneness with himself. While life is moving smoothly, they appear to be consistent Christians, but they faint beneath the fiery test of temptation. They cannot bear the reproach for Christ's sake. Do you love to hear the word of God but fall when the test comes? While life is moving smoothly, they appear to be consistent Christians, but they faint beneath the fiery test of temptation. They cannot bear the reproach for Christ's sake. I remember one day I was canvassing. This was about two weeks ago. And I got so tired because the sun was so hot. It was around 3 to 4 p.m. in Texas, and this is when the sun gets very hot. Sometimes 105, 106 degrees. But then it comes back down cooler in the evening. But I remember thinking, maybe I should go home. Maybe I should stop canvassing. Maybe I should quit. In the beginning, I made a plan. I'm going to canvass from 1 all the way to about 7 p.m. Give it about 6, 7, 8 hours a day. Go and do my best so that I could continue to fund my education and I could graduate. But sometimes it gets hot out there. Sometimes you just want to go home. Sometimes you're sweating and your whole body is drenched and you're like, I just want to go now. It is hot. It is hot out here. But I remember saying, you know what? Just let's get some cold, fresh cold water and let's continue working. Let's take a little break. So I saw a CVS. I walked over to the CVS and I was walking over to the CVS. And I remember seeing a wallet on the floor by a car. And it was a brown wallet and it was a woman's wallet. And I remember saying, all right. I need to return this wallet. But then I wanted to look inside, but with everything going on in society right now, I thought it maybe won't be a good idea to look inside this wallet. Just give it in, return it. Hopefully the person who owns it looks for it. So I walked inside the CVS. I got the, uh, I handed back the, wa the wallet to the clerk and I said, hey, somebody lost their wallet. Um, could you please return this to them? She's like, oh, thank you. Yes, I'll return it. So I got it. I went to go get a fresh bottle of water and I went outside took a little break to drink my water and, and, and just recuperate. I looked, turned around, I saw a, a young lady going into a car with her father. And then I asked her, hey, ma'am, did you lose your wallet? And she was like, yeah, I can't find my wallet. I don't have it. But she didn't really speak that much English. So I started to speak to her in Spanish and I was telling her like, oh, I found your wallet. I gave it into CVS. And then she was so happy. She came out outside, she was like, Oh, no tengo dinero, lo siento, like I don't have money. But I told her, it's okay, Dios te bendiga, like God bless you, it's all right. And I told, told her, tengo un regalo para ti, I have a gift for you. And I gave her the great controversy and I gave her uh, Desire of Ages. And she was so happy, she was like, what church do you go to? And I was a little nervous at that point because sometimes when people ask you what church you go to, then they just start to argue. You see all different types of people while canvassing. And I was like, oh ma'am, don't worry, the books are Christian, don't worry. And and she was like, no, but what church do you go to? And I was like, I go to, uh, I'm an Adventist. I, I go to a seven-day Adventist church. And she was like, oh, really? Okay, I'm looking for a church. Can you help me find a church? I was like, of course I can help you find a church. And then um, we were just talking about church and different ministries. And I told her, like, they even give Bible studies. She's like, yes, yes, I want Bible studies. I want to start studying the Bible with my whole family. I was like, amen. Then we just start signing up for Bible studies. Let's do it. I took all her information, her email, and then looking for a church for her in that area. What a blessing. And, and, and God showed me through his grace, through his mercy. Yes, there's going to be times that are going to be hard. There's going to be times when the sun is hot, but I am always with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Trust in me and I will make your path straight. And this is what God is saying for us. Let us hear his word. Let us hear his word on that good ground. Let us hear his word on that good ground. So when we hear the word, we can accept it into our lives and it can actually transform our lives. That we can have faith. What's the next? Let's go to the next one. The, the thorns. All right. We, we, we see these thorns. The grace and the purification of God must be, must be 
cultivated daily. Let, let's turn our Bibles to 1 John. It's all it's at the back of the Bible. Turn your Bibles to 1 John. 1 John. And 1 John, you're going to see here in in chapter 2, 15 and 16. And this is this is for all of us. This is a message that Jesus says for all of us. Do not love the world. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it is, it is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away. And the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Amen. So all these things that we see in the world, they are of the world. Let us not get caught up in this world. Let us not be even caught up in the lust of the flesh. Even the lust of the flesh of loving our flesh, loving our lives more than we love God, loving our lives more than we love the mission of God, loving our lives where we won't sacrifice ourselves for his mission, for his calling. Many people you see right now in society, we are afraid, we are afraid of what's going on, afraid to leave their houses, afraid to go out there and, and minister to others, afraid to show others love because of everything that's going on right now, coronavirus, everything, it, using the, the temptation of Loving our lives more than the mission of God to actually show love to others, to actually go out there and love others and to be there with others and to be for be there for others. Yes, we use safety precautions. Yes, we must use social distancing. Yes, we must follow all the laws of the land and abide in the laws of the land and make sure that we are following the laws. But also, we have to make sure that the cares, the riches, the pleasures are all used by Satan in playing the game of life for the human souls. And we need to do our very best to keep our eyes open to what's going on around us. Our hearts must be kept under the control of God. When David says in Psalm 51.10, let's turn our Bibles to Psalms 51.10. Psalms 51.10. And you're going to see what it says in Psalm 51.10. It makes it very clear to us. It says, right here, God said, uh, David says to God, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. That's what, this is what David is saying to God. Create in me a clean heart and renew the right spirit within me. That is David saying to God, keep my heart under your control, under your grace. Empower me with your Holy Spirit. That's what David is saying to God. And that needs to be our prayer every morning. That needs to be our prayer every day so that we could abide in God. How are we sanctified by the gospel day by day? How? It's by allowing the word to do its work in us, in humbling obedience to the word of God. There are two ways that our lives are going, brothers and sisters. There are two ways that our lives are always going. It's either we are gaining victory over sin or sin is gaining victory over us and it will eventually consume us. Again, brothers and sisters, this is hard truth that we must all accept. It's two ways that our lives are going. It's either we're gaining victory or we're being consumed by our sin or our sin is being gaining victory over us. And guess what? This sin will eventually consume us the same way that this victory will eventually consume us. We will be consumed by the victory of God if we're cons constantly giving our lives to God. We, are be we, we will be changed. We will be transformed. Or on the other hand, we will be consumed by sin. And the wages of sin is what, brothers and sisters? It's death. So that's what we need to really understand. We need to understand that we have to be aware of the things that choke the word of God in our lives, the things that are dangerous to our souls. Self-evaluation, sitting down so we could say, what things are truly dangerous to my soul? What things? And those are the things that we need to hand over to our loving Father in heaven, that we need to allow the, the Holy Spirit to transform our lives so we can hand those over to God. Bringing every thought, every action, every motive under the subjection of Christ so that Christ could live through us. Matthew 13, 
22. It shows us the deceitfulness of riches. It shows us right here. If we look at verse 22 in Matthew 13, it says, Now who receive the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. The deceitfulness of riches. So now we need to understand, right, that it's many things that happen to us. Studying in school for gain and not to gain souls for the kingdom of heaven. You don't, we don't understand that even things like our education could be used against us. Because what we're doing is we're choosing to put all our time, all of our energy into working and going to school just to make money. Instead of saying, you know what, I'm going to live out my calling for God. And I'm going to do something that could transform the world around me. I'm going to be a light to this world. So we need to be careful because even school can be dangerous. If, it's, if we're not going in our education, that's our calling that God has called us to. And we're not going for the right purposes if we're just going just to make a living and we're not living for others. The lust over other things. We need to be careful of the things in our lives we are lusting over. We have to make sure that the things that we gravitate to are not based on fulfilling the base passions that the enemy uses to medicate our pain instead of true forgiveness and allowing Christ to live through us. This is deep, brothers and sisters. We need to really look deep into this. There's many things in our life that are we're using as idols that we, we use to medicate our pain. There's things that we went through, whether it be in our childhood or whether it be in past situations in our life that we can use. Now we have things in our life that we use to medicate that pain. It could be drugs. It could be many different things that we use to medicate that pain instead of really seeking for that forgiveness where we can forgive, we can move on, and we can actually walk with God and experience the fullness of the gospel, the fullness of the life that God has for us. The cares of this world. We need to be careful of the cares of this world and, and, and the fact that it affects all classes of people. Some people may argue, well, only the rich are affected by that. No, also the poor is affected by that. The poor, the toil and, and, and that they face and they, they, the, the toil through fear. So they're saying, um, they, they're saying, I'm poor, so I have to work hard. And they bring perplex, perplexities on themselves. They bring problems on themselves and burdens. And now they say things like, I'm not gonna keep the Sabbath. I'm not gonna respect the Bible Sabbath from Friday uh, sundown to Saturday sundown, like in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 in creation, because I can't do that. I need to work too hard. I need to pay my bills. So instead of having faith in God and faith that God will provide as long as we're, we live accordance and obedience to his word, they allow life, the pressures, the thorns of this life to choke out the promises of God and the word in, in the word of God, and they won't follow it because they don't have faith in God and the trueness of his word and the trueness of his love and his, his promises. And that is the deep rooted of the problem. The rich, the cares of this world, it affects the rich. The, they, they fear the loss of, of the multitude that they have and it causes anxiety. Like they wanna keep the stock, they wanna keep their stocks, their investments and everything. And, and, it, and what happens is they don't live in accordance to the word of God because they need to work so hard because they need to keep up with that lifestyle. We have to remember the lesson that Christ taught us about the lilies of the field. He said the lilies of the field, they toil not nor they spin. And yet I say that none of them, um, none of them, even Solomon were not uh, arrayed or blessed like one of these. And, 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 and it's saying like, we need to realize the lilies of the field. God in heaven takes care of, of the lilies. God in heaven takes care of the birds. God in heaven takes care. Father in heaven, bless me. Give me strength. Give me peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have to remember the lesson that Christ taught us about the lilies in the field. 
that He will always take care of us. He will always provide for us. He loves us. Did you know? This is a very important question I want you to think about. Did you know that the cares of this world are supposed to draw us nearer to Christ and not push us further away from Him? Did you know that everything that you are going through in your life, that you may think is difficult, that you may think is something that you're worrying about, did you know that that's supposed to bring you actually closer to God, where we depend on God more? How beautiful is that if we took all of our cares, all our troubles to God? Many who may be very fruitful for working for God become bent on acquiring wealth. Their whole life are filled with business enterprise and they neglect the things of spiritual nature. Okay, we need to think about this. We need to think about everything that we're doing. All right. Whether it be school, whether it be work, we have to do it for the glory of God. Somehow, some way, we have to make sure that before anything that we do, we go to God first and we ask God, God, guide me. God, protect me. God, show me your way. Show me your will so that we could glorify God. Okay? You work hard. Go to school. Get your education. Let's read Revelations 12, 11, because I want to make sure that we know that working hard is biblical. Revelation 12, 11 right? It makes it very clear to us. It says, all right, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to death, okay? So work hard, but always make sure that you do everything in the will of your father in heaven so that you're not loving your life here on earth more than you're loving your life in heaven, why are some of the results so meager in Christian work? We may ask ourselves this question, why? Why are some of the results so meager? And it's because there needs to be a full consecration to God. A full consecration to God. The world, the world needs leaders that are consecrating to God when they're doing God's work, fully allowing the Holy Spirit to work through our lives. And the purpose behind what we do, like we said, must be pure. Merely to hear the word in a good sermon or to read the word in the morning is not good enough. There's a few principles that we must apply when we're studying the word of God. You have your favorite sermon, your favorite scripture. And let's say your favorite scripture is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. So Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not onto thine own understanding. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight, right? And he will direct your path. It's not enough just to hear that and say, amen. The next step of that is to meditate on that word. Apply that word to your life. Question God, God, can I trust in you? Of course he can, because he is going to show you, and it's okay to reason. God said, come, let us reason together. So question God, and, and, but you question him in a righteous way. You question him seeking answers through his word. Also, when you're looking for answers from God, wait patiently for the answers from God. And also, in prayer, it has to be the foundation of our lives because we can't go a moment without prayer because we're not safe. So also, cultivate, allow the word to be cultivated in our lives so that it could transform us into the image of God. So what are these points? Number one, meditate on the word. Number two, apply the word. Number three, it's okay to ask God questions and seek the answers through his word. Number five, number four, when we're seeking the answers in his word, wait patiently for those answers from God. Whether you're looking for answers to questions right now, whether you should move forward, which direction you should go, whether what you should study, seek his word. You may have to fast. You may have to go on your knees and really Pray hard with all your soul, all your heart. But when you're looking for this answer, you must waste patiently. And then also prayer. It has to be the foundation of our lives to cultivate the word in our lives. And then transform. Allow the word. Allow the word to transform and to do its good work in you so that you could be transformed into the image of God. Amen? So these are some things that we want to make sure that we're doing, okay? I meet people all the time in parking lot to our canvassing that they say, oh, the word is God is not real. But one thing I have not heard 
is a testimony that said, I've meditated on the word of God. I've applied the word of God. I've questioned God. I've got, I've waited for his answers. I made prayer a foundation of my life. I, I allowed the word to cultivate in my life, to plant a seed in my heart through patient toil. I worked with God and through the losses, through the disappointments, and I didn't see any fruit in my life. I never heard that testimony. I never heard a testimony that way. So r remember, right, that you, we, we face rejections all the time. And I see that from canvassing. Rejection, rejections. And it's the saddest part in the world where I see them distrusting the word of God. It's so sad to my heart. Like the disciples, there's disciples that said to Jesus, this, this word is too hard of a saying. This is too much. We cannot hear it. And that's what some disciples do. They walk away from Christ. And that's John 6, 60. And I pray that none of us walk away from God, but allow that word to transform our lives. Jesus encourages us in hope. Pick up your cross and follow me. Picking up the cross is not easy. Picking up the cross, there may be splinters. Picking up the cross is going to be heavy. Picking up the cross, we're going to be tired. Picking up the cross, we're going to have people spit on us. Picking up the cross, we're going to have people throw things at us. Picking up the cross, even when we're struggling to walk with God, even when we're doing our very best to carry our cross, instead of people helping us, they may push us down like they did to Christ. But in Philippians 4.13, it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Todo lo puedo en Cristo que me fortalece. Like God can do all things through us if we just put our trust in him. God can do all things. So, so we are called to take up your cross, pick up your cross and follow Jesus. All right. Matthew 16. Okay. Let's go to Matthew 16, 24 to 26. Matthew 16, 24 to 26. 24 to 26 and it makes it very clear what Jesus says to his disciples he says then Jesus said to his disciples if anyone desires to come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me all right now this is the key part for whoever desires to save his life will lose it but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it okay for what profits a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul so you have to, we have to make a choice, every individual. Are we going to die daily? Are we going to die to self and allow God to replenish our lives? And that's my prayer. Lord, replenish my life daily with your Holy Spirit. Use your word to transform me. Use your word to, to make me be transformed into your image. That's a daily prayer. That's a daily prayer. Because if you try to save your life on this earth, you will lose it. And what's the point of gaining this whole world Gaining all the riches, gaining all the fame, the worldly success, whatever you are aspiring for on this earth, and you lose your own soul. Mercy. Okay? Bear the reproach for Christ. Allow the power, the power and the might of Christ to work through you to fight off temptations. Victory. Victory is what we have in Jesus. Don't rely on your own impulses for you to think, oh, I'm going to be a good person. I'm going to be better day by day. No. It's not about us being better. The flesh it's, 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 it's enmity against God. The carnal mind, enmity against God. Now, we have to understand that it's God working through us. When we hand over our lives to Christ, when we hand over our thoughts to Christ, when we hand over our words to Christ, when we hand over our motives to Christ, when we hand over everything, this is what it's about growing in Christ. We're going to grow day by day by allowing Christ to live through us. So how is that practical? Every thought that I have, let me hand it over to Christ first. Let him filter it. Let him change it and then put it back into my mind. And if he approves it, I continue to focus on that thought and move forward with that thought. Every word that I'm going to give to others, let me think about and let me pray to the Lord that he will bless my lips, anoint my lips so that I could make sure that the words would first be approved by him before I share it to others so that every word can be a blessing. It could be edifying. It could be uplifting those around me. That's victory. Abiding in Christ every moment of the day, every moment of the hour. This is biblical. This is what God is, wants to do through us. He wants to abide in us. Did you not know that your body is the, Holy, is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Did you not know that this is just a shell and that it's the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of you that can work and do the work through you? you that's what abiding in Christ is about. Allowing the Holy Spirit to work through us, listening to that still small voice of the Holy Spirit and allowing it to work in our lives. 
Hearing the word, this is the main point. Hearing the word from an honest, humble heart will bear fruit from the start. Our victory is in Jesus because Jesus will come and abide in us and will allow his spirit to dwell inside of us and we will truly have victory. We're not living based on our faith in ourselves. Oh, I'm not going to sin anymore. I'm not going to do this anymore. No, we are handing over our lives to Christ. We're handing over our bodies to Christ. We're giving our soul, our all, our everything to Christ. And what Christ is doing is abiding in us and giving us that victory so that we can walk with him every single day like Enoch walked with God. And, and, that, and that's how we are looking to live our lives moment by moment. This is the purpose of growing in Christ. We are allowing this word to take seed into our hearts and we're allowing it to transform us into the likeness of Christ. Okay, now we get to the last ground. This is the victory. We're going to talk about victory here. We're going to talk about the hope. We're going to talk about how Jesus is looking to transform all of us right now. And this is in good ground. Okay, but he who receives the seed, this is Matthew 13, 23, but he who receives the seed on good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Amen, amen, amen. So we ask ourselves right now, what is the answer to it all? What is the answer to it all? And the answer is love. Love must be the foundation of all of our actions. Love is the foundation of God's government. It's the underlying principle in heaven and in earth. And it must be the foundation of Christian character. That love to God is revealed in sacrifice. Because we look at Christ's example. He loved us so much that he left his heavenly throne to come down here and sacrifice himself for us so that we could have a second chance. The same way the plan of salvation was was laid out, this plan of redemption was laid out and sacrifice is the same overall theme and blueprint for our lives is going to take sacrifice, brothers and sisters. The sacrifice that Christ made was so broad and so deep and so wide that it's immeasurable. Okay? The greatest example of a Christian life is one who is willing to sacrifice everything for the sake of his Redeemer. Through the honor, through the honor and glory of God, through honor and glory in God, that'll come first. That comes first. You say, you know what? Everything in my life is about, is, is about honoring and glory in God, glorifying God. If we truly love Jesus, if we love Jesus, we should live for him. Amen? If we love Jesus, we shall labor for him. If we love Jesus, we're going to allow that labor that you do it to be the light. So it doesn't matter what you do. You could be the financial director of Linda Vista University. You can be the, a medical student in Martha Morellos. You could be studying nutrition. You could be studying math. You could be studying to be a pastor. You can be a nurse at Southwestern Adventist University. Whatever it is that you are studying, you can be the president of Southwestern University, whatever it is, you can be the pastor in a church. The very labor that you do will be a light to this world. It will be a light in you and there will be a light for the world. The love, if you truly love Jesus, if you, if you truly love Jesus, for his sake, you will learn to possess and experience the toil of sacrifice, to sacrifice for him. And what will happen if you allow Jesus to cultivate in our lives? Number one, we will sympathize and we'll have a longing in our hearts for the salvation of men around us. We'll, have, we'll see everyone around us and we'll just have that burning desire in our hearts. I want to save these people by the love of Christ flowing through me so it could soften their hearts and they could learn more about God. We will feel the same tender craving for the souls the way that Jesus looked at them. That everybody, he saw something beautiful in there. But what will happen if we don't give our hearts all the way to Jesus? We will, we will continue to serve ourselves and we'll be stony ground hearers and we will not endure the tests when they come. But we're going to be good ground hearers. We're going to have good... Uh, soil. We're going to have the good ground where with an honest and good heart, we're going to hear the word, we're going to keep it, and we're going to bring fruit in our life through the patience of watching God transform us back into his image day by day. That's what growing in Christ is all about. 
So how do we prepare the soil? That's what somebody may ask. You use the, the that our life is like a garden. You use that our life is like um is is like a garden that God needs to cultivate. So how do we prepare our soil? The number one way is we truly need to understand the work of the Holy Spirit. We must constantly understand that the, the Holy Spirit is refining our characters. It's ennobling the character. It, it, the old habits is out, is gone. And now the new habits that reflect Christ because it's Christ living within us, empowering us through His Holy Spirit. And how do we know this? We need to look at the example of Christ's life. What did the Holy Spirit do for Christ? Think about that right now. What did the Holy Spirit do for Christ? Number one, Christ was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And we find that in Matthew 1, 8 to 21. Number two, Christ was baptized by the Holy Spirit. We find that in Mark 1, 9 and 10. Number three, Christ was led by the Holy Spirit. Okay, Luke 4, 1. Number five, Christ performed miracles through the Holy Spirit. Christ offered himself at Calvary through the Holy Spirit and now resurrected by the power of the Spirit. Romans 8.11 this is, this is what will change our lives. Romans 8.11, this, this verse changes our lives forever. Romans 8.11 and it states, But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you he who raised christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you god will give us life you're not gonna have a dead body anymore you're gonna not gonna have the the dead heart the, the just the deadness you're gonna have the light and the life of christ flowing through you you will have that light you will have that light let's turn to john 1 we turn to john 1 and we see it right here in John 1 that this is the light. This is the light that, that, that God, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was the life, and was the life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So what's going to happen when the Holy Spirit starts to do the work in you? The light and the wisdom of God will start to transform your mind, your heart, your soul, your body. And you are going to be, you're going to have that life in you, and you're going to become transformed into the image of God. But this is the question. Do you understand and accept the, Holy, the work of the Holy Spirit in your life? Do you understand through faith that this is not just a word that we read in the morning and in the evening? This is the actual word that has the power to create the universe, that creates the worlds, but also transforms me. It transforms my life. This is what we need to accept. We need to accept the working of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives you life to live the life that Christ calls you to live through His power. So we need to pray we need to pray. You might ask, well, okay, what do I have to do? Ask God. Ask God. God, give me the power to crucify self. Give, give, give me the power to give myself entirely to you into your hands. Seeking to do your will. Literally laying in the hands of Christ. Seeking for his power, his will. Like how a baby lays, a, a daughter lays in her heart father's arms that's the same way that we as have to be like little children laying in the hands of God we have to that's the only way we're gonna make it through we cannot rely on self the Bible says unless ye become like little children you will not enter the into the kingdom of heaven unless you are relying on God like how a daughter relies on her father you are not going to end up in the, in, the, in the kingdom of heaven because you are relying on self. Unless you submit your life to Christ where you rely on him for everything. To, 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 you, we don't understand this. That Christ, and Christ is the power that beats our hearts. Christ is the reason why we have breath. So we rely on him to breathe. We allow, rely on him for our hearts to beat. But we don't rely on him for our everyday lives. And that is the problem. This is where we have to find victory. We need to realize that it's not of ourselves. 
We are saved by grace, not of our own works, but because of God, because of his love. We need to realize that's the only victory we have is relying 100% on God because if it was up to us, we would fall in sin. Now, what happens once you give your life fully to God and you're, like, you're abiding him, you're uh, relying on him as if you are relying on him to breathe, you will be molded after his divine nature. In general, they admit their imperfections. I remember there was a story about a guru, and I heard this from one of uh, my online motivational mentors. His name is uh, Dr. Eric Thomas. He says there was a businessman who went to the guru, and he, he said to the guru, hey, I want to be successful. And this, the guru said, uh, meet me at the beach at uh, 5 a.m. He's like, 5 a.m.? All right, so he came to the beach with a suit on. And he walked, and he said, like, come on, walk to me in the water. He said, like, all right, he walked out to the water. He got to his ankles. He said, nah, walk me up. He got, he, he got a little further, and then he got waist deep. And he said, nah, come over here. He came all the way until the water was up to his neck. So then the, the guru took him and put him on the water. And he starts choking, and he starts, he starts just fighting for his life. And then he, he, he was like, he's about to drown. And right before he drowns, he pulls him back up. And then he's like, hey, what you... Like, he's like, until... He was like, until you need to understand what the guru was trying to teach him. He like, what did the guy want to do when he was gasping for air? What was he looking for? And he was looking to breathe. And then the, the whole idea behind that video was until you wanna until you wanna succeed as bad as you wanna breathe, you will not be successful. And that's the type of energy, that's the type of fire, that's the type of soul work we have to put into our Christian walk. Until you want to have Christ abiding in you, until you want to have Christ living in you as bad as you want to breathe, we are not going to truly have that walk with God. And I'm so sorry. We are not. We're not going to under... We are not going to experience the fullness of the gospel. I remember I was taking a plane ride back from LaGuardia Airport in New York City back to DFW. And when I came back to DF on the plane, the, the plane was facing turbulence. The plane was in a storm. The plane was shaking. And I did not know if the plane was going to successfully land. So I started to pray to God, Lord. I said, Lord, Lord, the plane is shaking now. And I'm shaking in a, the, the airplane. I'm like, Lord, please save my life. Please save my life, Lord. And I started praying hard to God. And, and, and God gave me softness in my heart to say, I'm with you. I'll protect you. Fear not. Fear not. It's like the disciples in the boat. But then the Holy Spirit also convicted my heart. This is how you get victory. If you start to pray to God like this when you face temptations in your life. Not just when you're on an airplane. Not just when you think you're going to die. But in your everyday walk. Why don't you pray like that? Why don't you pray to God with this much energy and this much force? Like when you are in a, a plane that might be able to crash. Or a speeding vehicle that's going so fast that you don't like how fast it's going. And you start praying to me. Pray to me like this all throughout your life. And I was convicted, brothers and sisters. I was convicted. Because it's in general that we admit as Christians, oh yeah, I'm not perfect. I have bad human uh, imperfections. But it's time that we become children of God. Where we truly rely on God. The point of being a child of God is to learn more of his divine nature day by day, to give up particular sins in our life. And, and this is when Christ said to Nicodemus, this is when Christ said to D Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be born again. So we may ask, what does it mean to be born again? Spiritually, physically, mentally. Everything in our lives for the honor and glory of God. This is something heartbreaking that I want to share. Many will see Christ face to face and be heartbroken, but they will, will be wishing their way into heaven, trying to experience Christ over the glimpses of shame they faced and they experienced, never experiencing the fullness of God. Because we are not serving God as bad as we want to breathe. And we are not understanding that Christ is the reason why our heart beats. Christ is the reason why our lungs work. Without the breath of God in our lives, we're dead. Without the, the, the breath of God in our bodies, we are dead. Once that breath leaves our body, we are dead. 
And until we start to realize that it's that it's God's power that allows us to wake up every day, it's God's until we have that gratefulness in our heart, and we we are just gonna constantly live for ourselves, and and have and have motives that are not for the honor and glory of God. Until we start to have that transformational change, there needs to be a point in our life when we make a we make a choice. When there needs to be a point when our choices meet to the, the divine power of God and you, we say to our, we say, I will experience the fullness of God. There needs to be a day when we wake up and we say, today is the day. This is the moment. Right now, I'm going to experience the fullness of God. I want every blessing that God has for me. Brothers and sisters, today is the day when we can say, there is a fullness, there is a joy, there is a peace that passes all understanding in walking in the obedience in the word of God. And today is the day that I want to experience the fullness of that. I want every blessing in life that God has for me. I want every blessing that God has for me. And how does that start? That comes from walking with God and having the word be planted in our hearts and growing and cultivating and having a life of obedience because we have a love for our creator. We appreciate what he done for us. We need that true holiness in order to be in wholeness to have that wholeness or we're always going to feel something missing. And that wholeness comes from obedience, appreciation, gratitude, and service to God. Christ, that's Christ cultivating the heart. Christ cultivating the soul. And Christ is asking you today for a consecration, to consecrate, to give your life to Him. And to be in a life of service for Him. And Christ deserves it. He deserves the heart. He deserves our mind. He deserves the soul. He deserves all our strength. Okay? The heart. Christ says it. You seek me and you find me when you search me with all your heart. So the question is, are you seeking God with all your heart? The mind. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Every thought that we have, everything must be under subjecting to God. All of our thoughts. Once we have a thought that is glorifying God, we continue to press in on that thought and continue to glorify God. When you have thoughts in our mind that we know do not come from God, but come from the enemy because they are not according to his word. We need to ask God for the power and the strength to delete that thought from our minds and to give us the power and the strength to overcome these temptations. The soul. Psalm 60, we need to give our souls to God. Psalm 61, 62, 1 says, Truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. So given not knowing that Christ is our atonement, Christ died for us. He atoned for our sins. His blood is all powerful and we need to really find rest of our souls in God. Our strength. Psalm 46, 13 says, God is our refuge, our strength in every present in the time of trouble, ever present. So are you saying that it is wrong from, to love myself? Some people may say that. I need self-love. It's about me. I need to enjoy my life. Self is not to be cherished, but we are to live a selfless life. If you are living through self, for self, or by yourself, it's not a true Christian walk. The work of the Holy Spirit must be constantly refining and ennobling the character. If not, the old habits will reveal itself in our lives. Now, I want to read from, for you some lyrics from a song that has been uh, blessing my life lately. And it goes like this. If you're looking for an offering, it's right here. My life is here. I'll be a living sacrifice for you. You're a fire, the refiner. I want to be consumed. I want to be tried by fire, purified. You take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. Honest and a good heart is not the heart without sin for the gospel is to be preached to the lost which includes you and me mark 2 17 christ said i come not to call the righteous but the sinners to repentance good ground is the only, is the one who has an honest heart which yields to the voice of the holy spirit first corinthians 10 13 will he not sin no, but he confesses his guilt and feels his need for mercy and love of God. Do you have sins in your life right now that you need to hand over to God? Do you feel the need to get the mercy from God right now? Do you feel the need to be made afresh and new? Do you feel that need in your heart? 
here's your chance to be a good ground here in receiving the word that we just spoke about and accepting all its conditions and requirements and habits because it's going to be the habits of Christ that live through you once you abide in God. Abiding is handing over your life to God every moment, every second of the day and not letting it be our thoughts, but letting it be God's thoughts and letting God's presence and His love and His grace and mercy consume us and being brought into submission to His word. We will not see the outcomes right away or be able to discern the purposes of God's providences. But everything that happens in our life is a part of God's provinces. And in the meantime, we just need to be in a moment of prayer every moment, just praying to him, asking for his will to be done in our lives. The Christian is to wait patiently for the fruition in his life of the word of God. Abiding in Christ through obedience to his word, we will have a living connection to the source of all strength. We will no longer live in a common life of selfishness, but Christ will live in us. His character will be re reproduced in our nature. Main point, hearing the word from an honest, humble heart, and you will bear fruit from the start. Your victory is in Jesus. Then you'll bring fruit for fruits of the Holy Spirit, some 30, some 60, and some 100. And you know what will, will happen? You start to walk around. Now you have Christ abiding in you. Now you're growing in Christ. And you're more loving to all those people around you. Second, you start to experience the joy, the joy of God. You're joyful. You're happy. You're feeling like, amen. Like you just see the blessings all around your life. And most of all, you're walking in accordance to God's word. You feel a peace to know that you're right with God. And what better thing to know that you're doing right before God. Amen. Long suffering. When when things happen around you, you you have more control. You you because God is abiding in you, and you could suffer with those around you. You have more you have more strength. Okay, kindness. You're more kind to people around you. You're you're just you're looking to be kind to others. Goodness. You're seeing the good in others, and there's so much goodness flowing through your life. Faithfulness. You're more faithful no matter what's going on around you, no matter the situation around you. You're faithful because you know that God is in control. Gentleness. You start to be more gentle with people around you. You start to be more kind, loving, gentle. And then most of all, self-control. You have self-control where the things that used to tempt you before, you can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and you're abiding in God. So you're holding on to God and you're saying, no, get behind me, Satan. I don't want that anymore. I want to truly walk with God and get the fullness of the experience. I want every blessing that God has for my life. Amen. To bring their minds that which would strengthen their faith. That's what Christ did. And I want to understand it. It's written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. We, don't, we can't even comprehend what God has prepared for us in heaven and in eternity. And, and God wants you to have faith in that promise. He rejoiced in the, this is what Jesus did. He rejoiced in the consciousness that he could and would do more for his followers than he had promised. And you know what God promised us? In John 1, he says, John 1, 1 to 4, do not let your heart be troubled. Brothers and sisters, are you going through troubles right now? You believe in God, believe in me as well. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, and, and, and in other versions it says, in my Father's house there are many mansions. If there were not so, would I, have, I would have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and welcome you into my presence so that you also may be where I am. You know the way, you know the way to the place where I am going and the way is Christ. With the power of Christ would flow forth love and compassion. It's going to cleanse your soul. And that's one thing that this world cannot do. But the word of God, it will cleanse your soul and make you like the character of Christ. That in His truth, you're going to be armed with the Holy Spirit. And you're going to go for it, conquering and conquering, getting victory, winning souls for the kingdom of heaven. Just through the love that pours through you. So it's an appeal. This is the appeal that I want to make for you watching here. And this is an appeal for myself. It's time that we have good ground. It's, it's, it's time that, that, that we understand that we have to abide in Christ. We have to grow in Christ every moment. It's a step-by-step, second-by-second. It's a relationship. It's a communion 
where we're living in the actual presence, abiding in God every second of the day. I remember I was canvassing in this parking lot last week and I saw a lady and then I was telling her, oh, por favor, ayúdame, un don donación de su corazón. Like I was canvassing her, asking her, can you please give me a donation for school? And she was like, oh, I'm sorry, I can't help you. And we were kind of far away from each other, but I saw her fiddling with like the car seat and then she had a box on her side. And she was saying, oh, I asked her, what is that box for? And she was like, it's a breeding machine. I have, I got pneumonia because I got, I had COVID-19. And I don't know if she still had COVID-19, but it just really touched my heart because I was just like, wow, this lady has to use a breeding machine to breathe. And me, myself, I could breathe, I could preach, I could go to school, I'm healthy, I'm strong by the grace of God. But it was the Holy Spirit speaking to my heart to be like, be grateful. Be grateful to God for all the blessings. And when you hear the guiding voice of the Holy Spirit in your life, you should listen to it. Because tomorrow's not promised. And brothers and sisters, we need to pray for discernment so that we can start to hear the guiding voice of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That's what truly abiding is God is about. To hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and listen to that voice. Don't listen to the voice that comes from the enemy. But listen to the voice that comes from God. Now, and I want to make, I, I want to make appeal. Whether you're watching at home, you could, you could stand, and you could stand right now if this is what, if, if this is for you, or if, if you're sitting at your computer screen, wherever you're watching this, maybe you're watching this on your phone. You will raise your hand, and, and you will say, you will say, Lord, take my life. Lord, allow me to abide in you. Lord, I want to be filled with your Holy Spirit. Because Hebrews 11.6 says, He that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He's a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. So right now, if you are diligently seeking to be transformed by the Word of God, you raise your hand, you say, Lord, and the Lord will see that hand. The Lord will see you. The Lord will see you making the decision in your mind and your heart to say, Lord, I know you're a re rewarder of those that seek you. Let me seek you. Okay? The glory of God wants to come into your life right now. All right. The Holy Spirit was to fall on you and to be consuming in your life like a consuming fire so that God could cultivate the soil in your life. This is your opportunity to give your life totally to God. All right. You will become a living sacrifice for him. Do you have a sincere desire where you want to say, Lord, I want to know your truth. Lord, I want to believe in heart. Lord, I want to have faith in your word. Lord, I need divine guidance every step of the way. Lord, send your angels to protect me. Lord, I want to experience the treasures of your truth. Brothers and sisters, whether it be through online, whether it be in church, wherever it is, the power of the word of God is here to transform us. And you can make a decision right now to give your life to Christ. You can make a decision to let go of the sins, let go of the bad habits, let go of that character, and to have God flow through you, the Holy Spirit shower you with blessings every morning so that you could be filled with the fullness of God. So you could truly experience this gospel and this word that God has for us. Brothers and sisters, this is your opportunity to hand your life to God. And if anybody who's standing here, it's me. I'm standing. Because every single day I pray to give my life to God and for the Lord to create in me a clean heart. Let us pray. Let us pray together. And I pray that right now you are making that decision for God. I pray if you're watching this, you are making a decision for God to give your life for Him so He can work through you and the blessings of God can flow through you and that you can abide in Him and one day see the Lord face to face and He can say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word. Father, I pray that we will be good ground hearers. I pray that you will transform our lives and our hearts. I pray that we could abide in you and we could trust you and we can listen to that still small voice and we can make the decisions that glorify you, Father. I pray that you will create in us a clean heart and that we could one day see you face to face and you could say, welcome, come into my kingdom. I love you and you, and, and you have, you have, you have been doing good, my good and faithful servant. That's the words that we want to hear. Father, thank you for sending your son to die for us. Thank you for sending the comfort of the Holy Spirit to empower us, to transform us, to change us. And I pray after re going through your word, we could be changed. And we could be filled with your spirit day by day until we see you again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And thank you for joining me. God bless you all.
God loves you. You're a special. And thank you so much for joining me. Uh, God bless you.